Really quick disclaimer, so everything you're about to see in my World War II PowerPoint is slightly graphic. You're going to see a dead soldiers, you're going to see people being burned, um, victims of the Holocaust, you're going to see um, victims of bombings. Um, I don't want to sugarcoat history for you. I don't think that that's right. I think that's how we get people that are numb and, in my opinion, unintelligent and unaware of the vicious cycles that can happen, and that's why there were two world wars. And this is my job to try and educate you so that there's not a third. I know we joked about it in the beginning of the year, but like, I don't want that cycle to continue. So please, I understand if you have to skip through it, if it gives you like some kind of anxiety or something like that, I understand. I'm not asking you to stare at graphic stuff. I just want you to understand the gravity of the actions of people in the past. Hey everyone, so per the disclaimer that you guys already saw, um, we are going to be talking about World War II. And from, for today, we're really going to focus on the rise to, uh, we can do it, we can really, we're going to focus on the totalitarian leaders and um, their rise to power and what their ideologies were. So we're going to talk about the fascists, the Nazis, and the communists and why these ideologies are kind of bad. Um, they're very bad. So um, the three leaders that we're really going to talk about are Mussolini, Stalin, and Hitler. So right here we have Stalin, Mussolini, and then Hitler in the middle. Okay, so after World War I, many nations were struggling to rebuild, um, and the Treaty of Versailles created bitterness among many nations. A global depression in the 1930s led to high unemployment and a sense of desperation in all of Europe, and um, which, was a, which is a huge problem. So in 1929, the U.S. stock market crashed, um, and that kind of affected the entire world, because we were one of the mass traders and the fact that we weren't demanding things from other countries kind of s caused them to go into a depression um, because our stock ex exchanges, everything is all interconnected uh, globally. In this climate post-war uncertainty, nationalism increased and citizens turned to totalitarian dictators to rule the nation. In the past video about the Russian Revolution, I was telling you about Joseph Stalin and how he kind of took over power in 1927 of the Soviet Union. And he also pretty much, he slaughters everybody in what's called the Great Purge, which is 8 to like 13 million people. We're also going to talk about Adolf Hitler and how he offers the economic stability that these Germans are desperately seeking after the, you know, absolutely crumbling effects from the Treaty of Versailles. Um, he becomes chancellor uh, during 1933. Um, then we're going to talk about Benito Mussolini, his rise to power in 1922, and he attempts to restore Italy to its former position as a world power. He's trying to bring back Rome, like the idea of the Roman Empire, essentially. Um, and then we have Francisco Franco. He leads the uh, rebel nationalist army to victory in Spain and gains complete control of the country in 1939. So we have Francisco Franco, who actually will kind of be a... a kind of helper to the Nazis, somewhat neutral. We There's a lot of arguments to decide what, what Spain really was, but we'll talk more about him. And then, of course, we have um, Hideki Tojo. Uh, or Tojo. Uh, he's the force behind Japanese strategy and becomes Japanese prime minister in 1941 after um, after people really decide that Emperor Hiro Hirohito becomes a powerless figurehead. So essentially, these are some posters. So that's Mussolini. No, it's yes, that's Mussolini, Hitler. We just saw some Stalin. Here's Tojo. Okay. So the totalitarian, totalitarian leaders are dictators who control all aspects of the government and the lives of citizens. So the total the leaders gain. <laughs> that's a big word to say. Every that's a tongue twister. These total leaders gain support by promoting jobs and nationalism and using a lot of propaganda. Uh, dictators held onto their power by using censorship, secret police, denying liberties, and eliminating opposal rivals, opposing rivals or political parties. Um, among the first uh, totalitarian dictators was Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union. He grabs power right after Lenin, is, uh, he dies of a stroke. Um, Stalin was communist and seized all property, farms, factories in order to control the economy and create equality. He used a secret police and the Great Purge to eliminate rivals. During the Great Purge, like I said, he killed 8 to 13 million people whom he thought were his possible rivals. 
Stalin's five-year plans and collective farms improved the Soviet Union's industrial and agricultural output. So he was kind of modernizing the, the military. He was trying to modernize this country as best as he could. Um, not all not all leaders and not all dictators were communists. In Italy, Germany, and Spain, people actually turned to an extremely nationalist government called fascism. Um, fascist governments were controlled by dictators who demanded loyalty from citizens, and they did not offer democracy and used one party to rule the nation. Unlike communists, fascists believed that people could actually keep their property, so instead of fascists going in and taking stuff from people like the communists did they were like you can keep your property unless you were jewish uh, we'll get to that so mussolini and hitler believed in fascism and the idea that nation needs strong dictators total authority by one party but that people can keep their private property stalin was a communist and he believed that the government should control all property and business in Italy, Benito Mussolini formed the Fascist Party, and Mussolini gained popularity by promising to revive the economy, rebuild the military, and expand Italy to create a new Roman Empire. Like I told you, they weren't happy that Rome had died, and uh, they wanted to bring it back. Again. Mussolini named his Fascist Party after the Fasces a Roman symbol, or after the, yeah, the Fasces, a Roman symbol of authority and power. Mussolini created the Black Shirts, which is a secret police force to enforce the goals of his fascist party. Uh, this is their uniform. This is kind of what they looked like. This is actually a picture of them. So, yay. In 1922, Mussolini was popular enough to lead a march on Rome and force the Italian king to name him prime minister. I want you to hear this. This man was popular enough, not powerful yet, but popular enough to march to Rome and forced the king of Italy at the time to name him prime minister. A pri as prime minister, Mussolini was known as the Duce. Um, Duce. It looks like Duce, <laughs> well, which is the chief. And Mussolini ended democracy in all opposition parties. He also built up the military to create new jobs, and he planned to conquer new territories in Africa for Italy. So now we're going to see imperialism once again. Um, we talked about a lot of causes to World War I. The main causes, main was militarism, um, alliances, imperialism, nationalism. It's the same idea again. There's more fuel and anger behind this one. There's a lot of personal grievances that actually really kind of built up the causes of World War II. But for the dictators themselves, they used that to fuel their other prerogatives, which were led by imperialism. The Nazis were a fascist group in Germany that wanted to overthrow and dis, uh, the disloyal Weimar Republic. Uh, Adolf Hitler was actually an early Nazi recruit and quickly rose to power in the Nazi party. So the Nazi party existed before Hitler. He joined the Nazi party. Um, but how he started, I think I told you in the other video that he was actually a soldier fighting for the... Um, Bavarian or Bulgarian, one of the two. I can't. I get those two mixed up a lot. But he was fighting for their army, and um, and he was actually he was actually Austrian by birth. But um, he was fighting for the I think the, I think it's Bulgaria, yeah, the B Bulgarian army, and um, during World War One, and a British soldier cornered him and was going to shoot him, and then he decided to not shoot him, and he it was on record that he said, "I've seen enough death today. Or, I've seen too much death today," and then walked away. And left Hitler there. This close <laughs> to not having to deal with him. But the fact remains that the Nazi party was still there. So the fact that whether some could argue that whether Hitler was there or not, that World War II was going to happen. Who knows? Um, we got stuck with the reality where he lived. So anyway. Um, but he uh, angered... He was very angered by the, uh, the the Treaty of Versailles and all the terms forcing Germany to take blame because he decided after the war to then adopt Germany and like the Aryan race and all that stuff. That was his thing. Even though even though he promoted stuff like blue eyes and, and blonde hair, if you notice, Hitler had brown hair and I think he had brown eyes. Didn't even fit his own profile. Hitler was impressed by Mussolini and used many of his ideas to make the Nazi party strong in Germany. So timeline we have we have Mussolini and Stalin kind of at the same time a little like within a year of each other and then we have Hitler 
Um, Hitler was rising through the Nazi party a lot, and then the stuff that he was promoting, he actually started talking in pubs. He started talking at, like, just, like, little small gatherings, and then he joined the Nazi party, and they were like, oh, his energy is really good. He can influence a lot of people. So that's why he rose to power so quickly. <sighs> All right, so here's some pictures. We have one of Hitler, and then we have some here with the swastika and all this awesome stuff. Not really. Thank you. So the Nazis created their own militia called the Brown Shirts, and Hitler planned a march on Munich, but he was arrested and jailed for nine months. Hitler was arrested, and then in this point, he wrote Mein Kampf. While in jail, uh, he wrote the book which outlined his plans for Germany. He wrote that Germans were members of a master race called the Aryans, and all non-Aryans were inferior. He declared that Germans needed Leben Lebensraum, which is living space, and should conquer Eastern Europe and Russia. He called the Versailles Treaty an outrage, and he vowed to regain land taken from Germany after the war. So I told you that the German, like the German Empire and Austria-Hungary, right, that whole area was shrunk after World War I, and a lot of uh, territories were then divided off into the Slavic territories. We get Poland from this, we get lots of territory in Prussia. Russia was also forced to give up territories, that's how they got out of World War I. Um, I told you that Lenin, he was, he signed off like at the time what was the Eastern Front, he signed off like the whole thing. Pretty much wherever he lost territory and like strength in, to the Germans in World War One, he was like, okay, cut it off, we're done. And so then they became their own little nations. Um, alrighty, so if you think history isn't amusing, then you clearly have never seen Adolf Hitler wearing shorts. I've included a very ridiculous picture for you. He's hideous and disgusting. Okay. So when Hitler was released from jail in 1924, he spent years organizing the Nazis into Germany's most powerful political party. Alrighty. In 1933, Hitler was named Chancellor, which is the equivalent of Prime Minister of Germany. And as Chancellor, Hitler used his power to name himself Dictator. He called his government the Third Reich to promote pride and nationalism. His whole goal was to see a thousand year reign of his Reich, his Third Reich. And if he wasn't going to see that, then it was going to be doomsday. It was going to be Armageddon. He was going to fight to the very last German on Earth. That was his initial goal. We'll talk about Hitler's psyche a little bit, which I think is actually kind of interesting. So Hitler put Germans to work by building factories, highways, weapons, and increasing the military, which according to the Treaty of Versailles, he was not supposed to do. He created the government protection squad called the SS and a secret police called the Gestapo and they were to eliminate rivals and control all aspects of Germany. So this is another police state. This is um, militarism. This is the idea of completely taking over and giving people zero freedom to do anything. And um, the SS, you have the stormtroopers, you're having the Gestapo. Their duties will change. Give it time. In 1935, Hitler began a series of anti-Semitic laws called the Nuremberg Laws. Now, ironically, once we arrested all of the Nazis, we called it the Nuremberg Trials. Anyways, so the Nuremberg Laws that deprived German Jews of their rights as citizens and forbade mixed Jewish marriages and required Jews to wear a yellow star. So essentially what he's doing is he's forcing Jews to identify themselves and what he hired Joseph Goebbels to do. Uh, Goebbels is the head of... Um, he's kind of like the dude in charge of all the propaganda. Um, people that didn't have radios before were given free radios, but here's the catch. These radios only tuned into one station, and that station was controlled by Goebbels, or Gerbils. And um, so what he's doing is he's infiltrating, actually, if you think about it pretty quickly, he becomes chancellor in 33, and he's already doing these anti-Semitic laws in 35, and he's creating the idea of the other. This happens a lot in ancient history. We talked about the Age of Exploration, how these different conquistadors came over and they slaughtered all these different people simply because they were not them. By religion, by color of their skin, by everything that they were. They were not a white European Catholic, so therefore they were the, they were the enemy, they were the other. And in a lot of texts, even from um, Greek philosophers, we have them called the monstrous races. They're called, they're, that's how you identify and create an enemy. You, you completely take away their identity. In the Holocaust, um, with the concentration camps, they were only ever supposed to identify themselves as a serial number, which was tattooed on their arms. 
and if they did not identify themselves as this number, they were shot. So we see this already starting. And surprisingly, Hitler realized that he couldn't just outright do the anti-Semitic laws. Um, he couldn't expunge them from Europe as he um, had been planning. But he realized that he would have to do this slowly. And even though two years actually seems pretty quick, compared to his power level, it's actually, it, was, it was like, not baby steps, but like little, little strides, if you will. Um, okay. Where'd you go? What happened? How did I do that? In 1938, Hitler ordered Kristallnacht. This is uh, the Night of Broken Glass, which is a series of, of attacks on Jewish synagogues and businesses. All of the little red spots here, this is, um, these are attacks. These are people's places that were hit. And about, I think, a little over 100 people were killed in Kristallnacht. Um, there's a I've actually read a lot of personal accounts from survive, like people that witnessed it, both on the Jewish and German side, and there were um, there were actual like media reports happening on this. But the problem was, especially in Europe, there was a distrust in media headlines because in World War One, um, there one of the newspapers was falsely printing out titles and articles about how the Germans were like torturing Bulgarian babies, which which they weren't. I mean, at the time, you know, I know we want to kind of create an enemy of the Germans, but uh, it's not just all of Germany. Not every single German was a Nazi, and I want you to understand that. So, but because of these false headlines that was put out in World War One, people then stopped believing and taking a lot of, you know, very, very flat... I guess you could say flashy, but also very um, serious headlines, like as actual truth. They had problems with that. Um, so people knew. The word was getting out, but not a lot was happening with it. Now, after World War I, Japan was the strongest nation in Asia and was ready to conquer new lands to provide resources for the Japanese industry. Um, Emperor Hirohito gave full control of his Japanese military to uh, Tojo, who served as a military dictator. Now, I've actually read some interesting stuff about Tojo. Uh, he he was a very, you know, by-the-book military dictator, and he, he hired some very interesting people, one that I definitely would like you guys to research for yourself if I don't get to him, but I think I will when I talk about Pearl Harbor, is his one admiral, um, Yaramoto, I think his name is, and uh, he is, he was a very brilliant man, and just kind of like how the Manhattan Project with like Einstein and a lot of different scientists, these are brilliant people, but their brilliancy is not being used for the greater good, it's actually being used to destroy, and that's, that's, that's where the problem is. You can be brilliant all you want, but how you use your intelligence is really, it is a weapon, and you have to watch how you use it. It's important. So in the 1930s, Japan, Italy, and Germany began aggressively expanding into new territories, and these actions caused World War II in 1939. So as we can see, a lot of their, um, these, these powers that were, they're, they're going to be known as the Axis powers. The Axis powers gaining all this territory is making people nervous again. They're like, okay, we just went through this. We just had a war over this. Can we please not do this again? The Treaty of Versailles outlined it. You're not supposed to be doing this stuff. But guess who didn't sign it? We didn't, so we couldn't really enforce anything. Italy invaded Ethiopia and Albania. Now, Ethiopia is here in Africa, and Albania is attached up here, bordering the Mediterranean Sea right near uh, Italy. Japan invaded Manchuria, uh, which is northern China, and they also invaded uh, Indochina and the East Indies, which is right over here. This territory is right there. Germany annexed Austria and Czechoslovakia. So at this point, what this, what this means when he annexes, he kind of kicks them out of the German Empire. He's like, you have a lot of Jews in your territory, so get you out of Germany. Okay, so I think... We can stop here, because um, I've, I've introduced all the dictators to you, 
and I've introduced how they've, uh, you know, come to power. So we'll pick up um, when we talk about fighting World War II and various battles that were truly historic and made a huge difference on both the Axis power and the Allied powers. Um, and then the Holocaust itself will be a separate uh, segment. So, all right. Talk to you soon.